break about the story, the kind of primal scene of the birth of translation, which is the uh, Septuagint, the, the 72 elders um, that spent some time on the beach, uh, basically conferring in order to produce uh, a Bible translation. And it occurred to me today for the first time that that must have been a blast. Um, and, but maybe not quite so much fun as I'm having here. So thank you for that. Um, if I could have, you know, commissioned the, okay, maybe not 72, but something like 29 elders, and maybe not all elders, but certainly young people too, then this is exactly what I would have done. So thank you all for making this happen. I'll begin by going back to that essay that I posted on the website, or that Michael posted for me, um, in which I argue that the adoption of a modern apparatus for learning languages, including dictionaries and grammars, um, entailed the expulsion of the Jewish Christian convert from the scene of translation. Um, and now I'll just add that along with expelling the convert, the grammar and the dictionary also cleared the space of translation more generally of lived experience and the body in favor of more abstract notions of what translation is and how it operates. But of course, as we heard um, just in the session before this one, translation history never managed to rid itself entirely of its dependence either on converts or like any other human operation, on the exigencies of the body, affect, or emotion. The German missionary who spoke of the mess and filth that was the Jewish tongue produced the translation he did not only through academic evaluations of linguistic equivalents or rational considerations of how best to reach his target audience, um, the, the visceral revulsion he felt for the Jewish jargon and its speakers manifested itself in a particular style, a Germanizing style, that he himself felt was purifying. And Chaim Henry Einspruch's embrace of a more fully Jewish Yiddish was no doubt accompanied by similarly complex emotions, including, I would guess, a kind of rage or aggression Yiddish missionary translation may allow us a particularly intimate view of the range of emotions that might accompany translation, along with the officially sanctified attitudes of Christian love wedded to textual fidelity. But no doubt languages in all sorts of situations evoke powerful emotions, not only in the things they communicate, but also metalinguistically as proud national languages or vulnerable endangered tongues as the homey familiar language of the self or the alien and opaque language of the other. Um, how do we begin to describe such effective relationships to language, much less register um, how these affects might shape translation? Among the earliest discoveries of psychoanalysis is that language can't be abstracted from the body, its desires, or its experiences. Studies in hysteria, co-authored in 1895 by Freud and Breuer, um, begins with the recognition that hysteria is intimately tied with language. And the way that you actually diagnose whether somebody has a hysterical paralysis or, a, let's say, biological one is, does anyone know? Um, the, a, a kind of biological paralysis very rarely follows uh, let's what, um, what might be called the linguistic body. In other words, a paralysis that has some kind of physiological basis will involve a nerve that runs from the tip of your middle finger up to your uh, shoulder or armpit. A hysterical uh, paralysis is of the hand, which in fact is not a physiological category, but a linguistic one. So language is all important in determining what constitutes hysteria. Um, Freud and Breuer more particularly describe a number of patients who suffer from disorders that 
circle around this region of mouth, throat, and chest, neck, nervous coughs, anorexia, tightness of the chest, and various forms of aphasia, the loss of the ability to speak. In their attempts to interpret these symptoms, Freud and Breuer laid the grounds for a theory that could travel the pathways between affect and sign, body and language. And these pathways are not limited to the pathological manifestation of mental suffering and physical symptom. They also are generally true for all individuals. Um, the body always functions as a sign system, cultural and physiological at the same time. And the example that Freud gives is blushing, which expresses the inner affect of embarrassment or perhaps sexual desire, while also communicating with others in extremely culturally conditioned ways. And you think about the connection between gender and blushing in the courtship scene. In describing this interarticulation of language and body, Freud and Breuer relied heavily on metaphors of translation and conversion, which I think people here know. Um, the model they constructed was designed to explain the mysteries of, of hysteria, but read within the context of the cultural term and translation studies, psychoanalysis may also provide us new tools in the wider effort to bring back the body, emotions, and the mess of human experience into the study of translation. It's by now well known, and certainly in this room, that translation served as a central metaphor in the, in the development of psychoanalysis. Freud's basic understanding of the psyche was as a dynamic system connected in all its dimensions through translation, and he used a variety of terms for translation, German terms, Übersetzung, Übertragung. This psyche, and I'm sorry that my German is basically Yiddish, um, this, though in Yiddish you'd say Übersetzung, um, the psyche has at, at its commands many languages and many types of languages. Can I still use that? Oh, I can, yeah. Dreams are essentially, in Freud's terms, hieroglyphics, pictorial translations of, for instance, socially unacceptable wishes. A psychoanalytic session involves the translation of dream images into spoken descriptions the psychoanalytic interpretation is yet a further resignification, rewording, rewriting, but one which ideally translates these images and their verbal description back into their original significations. The all important psychic operation of transference, whereby relations with the analyst stand in with relations with your mother, um, stand in for, in, um, is called in German Übersetzungsliebe, which is a word that we need in this room. It could be translated love or even possibly translation love. Um, in one particularly elaborate expansion of the metaphor, and there are many, Freud described hysterical symptomology as a pictographic script which we were able to read once we had discovered a few cases of bilingualism. Freud seems to be alluding here to the Rosetta Stone and other similar multilingual monuments in which parallel texts in, for instance, demotic Greek or hieroglyphics allowed linguists to finally crack the code um, on the stone or to finally crack the code of hieroglyphics. Hysterical symptoms also seem to occur in broader patterns and the first code Freud cracked was the connection between the emotion of disgust and symptoms of the mouth, and in particular, the tussis nervosa, the nervous cough. Um, and I'll note here that this term combines affect, right, nervosa, and physical symptom, the cough, but it does so through another translation um, into Latin, a kind of distancing academic medical tongue. Um, exactly what to do with it, I'm not sure. So translation works in at least two different modes in such psychic processes. On the one hand, it expresses this translation from trauma to symptom, expresses suffering in the body, and it's because it's in some sense a faithful translation that interpretation and psychoanalysis 
can reconstruct that lost original experience. On the other hand, it's in the very nature of such psychic translation from suffering or trauma or desire to symptom that it evades direct expression, it censors, forgets, misdirects. This mode of indirection is not limited to neurotic speech. The different registers of language and the different languages that we all use enable speakers both to express and to conceal. As for instance, when you move into French to describe some sexual act or into Latin to assert a kind of medical mastery over a situation. This transformation that's both true and misleading um, and that may even be an outright fraud um, applies as well, and this came up uh, in Shen Xin's uh, presentation, to the figure of the convert. And in fact, the term conversion, and here the term usually used, but not always by Freud and Breuer as conversion, is used in psychoanalysis nearly, interchange nearly interchangeably with the term translation. So all these discussions of how Freud used translation also work for the term um, <coughs> conversion. I say nearly interchangeably because Freud seems to reserve the term conversion for those translations that cross the boundary between psyche and body. It's for this reason that Freud and Breuer promoted the term conversion disorder for the disease that had been known as hysteria. Um, and both terms coexisted for a while, but the present clinical term for what used to be called hysteria is now conversion disorder. Um, and the re I think it's sort of obvious why they chose to go with conversion disorder. Conversion disorder removes the kind of uh, essentialist connections with women and the, hysteria, the, the womb, um, the uterus, and it also announces that these are not purely physical disorders, but that somehow connect body and soul, we might call it. Um, conversion is thus what Jakobsen calls intersemiotic translation, that is, translation between sign systems of different types. Freud may have been registering here some of the complexities of Jewish and Christian views of conversion, in which spiritual and carnal notions of conversion stand in some tension and even in, are, are intricately connected in the case of Jewish Christian conversion in which spiritual baptism in Christ both supersedes and fails to erase circumcision of the body. Reading in their hysterics the outlines of, a, of the psyche as a system of translation and conversion, Freud and Breuer also discovered that many of these patients described themselves as having two selves, one watching and one acting, one bad, one good, um, one in communication with the world, and one hiding somewhere. The historian Yermiahu Yovel claims that such a split consciousness is the very defining feature of modern subjectivity, and he traces the roots of this split to the complexities of conversion. The basic understanding of the subject as split between an outer and inner self emerged, in his view, from the experience of the mass conversion of Iberian Jews to Christianity um, in the 15th, 16th century and before. The conversion of Iberian Jews to Christianity solved one set of problems, but the solution itself soon developed some cracks. These new Christians, who were also called conversos and also called Muranos, I'll use those terms interchangeably, though they're not entirely interchangeable. Um, these new Christians were imagined as insincere converts, hiding a secret attachment to Jewishness behind a facade of Christian piety. Such skepticism, whatever its basis in Jewish realities, no doubt also reflected Christian self-doubt of the sort Vince alluded to a couple of days ago when he spoke of conversion as a never completed operation. Nor did the quote unquote return to Judaism of a new Christian resolve these fissures since this new Jew, and that was the actual term, whether in reality or in Jewish skepticism about 
this return, also sometimes conceals a new Christian who continues to miss Christmas. And this new Christian, in turn, conceals a crypto Jew. It's just a Russian doll, yet another Russian doll. This multiplying pattern repeated itself in a different register in Spinoza, the philosopher Spinoza, whose secret was neither crypto-Judaism nor crypto-Christianity, but rather reason, and who thereby became the first modern philosopher. So with Spinoza, we can say that the split between exterior and interior, painful and dangerous as it undoubtedly was, could also be culturally productive. It was Muranos and their descendants caught between absolutist religious traditions who thereby discovered the subjective mind, the, relativ the relativity of human truth, the values of this worldliness and secularism. That is to say, it was Muranos who invented modernity and the modern self for themselves, but eventually for all of us. Despite or because of the ways that modernity has made us all Muranos, the Murano remains a persistent figure of dis-ease. The Inquisition was invented to persecute Muranos in the pursuit of Christian truth, while Muranos, converts, translators, and border crosses of various types are still treated as suspect by the modern nation state. To my knowledge, Yovel does not include Freud in his genealogy of modernity, um, in which I think Freud might count as the major theorist of modern Murano identity. But Michel Foucault, in one of the most provocative claims in the history of sexuality, does connect the converso experience in psychoanalysis, tracing a genealogical link between the Inquisition project of ferreting out crypto Jews using instruments designed to turn pain or let's say translate pain into confession, and the psychoanalytic session in which a suffering patient is similarly compelled to expose her most secret truths. While Yovel sees the Murano as providing a general model of modern consciousness, he also describes conversos more particularly as forerunners of the secular Jew. The first secular Jew, according to Yovel, was Spinoza, who despite being excommunicated from the Jewish community for his rationalist heresies, never converted to Christianity, creating a space for a modern identity not predicated on belonging to a religious community. The modern Jewish self is in some sense a converso more generally in the sense of having a particular kind of split consciousness. This split as uh, historians and sociolinguists have mapped it, includes a psycholinguistic component in which the exterior self and the interior self speak different languages. The Yiddish linguist Max Weinreich makes a fundamental distinction between external and internal bilingualism. The language is shared by Jews, which include two languages, um, Hebrew and Yiddish, or Hebrew and whatever the, the Jewish vernacular is, um, and those languages used with outsiders. While Weinreich focuses on Eastern Europe, he adds that elements of Yiddish and the structure of internal and external bilingualism persisted among westernized Jews for generations after they turned to German. Weinreich's ostensibly neutral sociological terminology of external versus internal bilingualism in fact rests on the same highly charged spatial allegory that Yovel traces from Iberia to Jewish and Western modernity. The two types of bilingualism are not merely variations on the same phenomenon, they also carry with them an implicit structure and ideology that distinguishes external facade from hidden essence, authentic speech from superficial performance. With these terms, Weinreich taps into a tacit but widely shared ideology about Jewishness and language. Jewish languages not only express and embody what it means to inhabit both a Jewish internal world and an outside world, we still use that language, they also constitute the interior organization of any individual Jewish self. 
Jewish languages lurk, as it were, within and behind the non-Jewish languages also spoken by Jewish multilingual, multilinguals. And these languages constitute the authentic self concealed by the facade presented to outsiders. In this way, we're all uh, you know, inquisitors. Yudel Marx, uh, Yudel Marx was a uh, important Yiddish linguist. Yudel Marx's eulogy for Abraham Joshua Heschel, the theologian and activist uh, Heschel, drew on these shared assumptions when he described Yiddish as not only Heschel's native language, but also has his neshama lashon. Neshama means soul in both Hebrew and Yiddish. Um, this was more than a simple assertion that Yiddish was the language in which Heschel could express himself most comfortably. The psychoanalyst and Yiddishist, and I'm sorry about that photo, but I took it from his website, so it's on him. <laughs> the psychoanalyst and Yiddishist Max Kahn transposes this thought into a secular register when he begins his book on Yiddish and Freud with the sentence, my unconscious speaks Yiddish in French. This psycholinguistic ideology is an open secret erupting to the surface in a range of Jewish jokes. Um, as for instance, this one, and I think I told another one last time I was here, so I'm not gonna repeat that one, but Mrs. Cowan is at the country club and um, the waiter at this fancy country club spills her soup in her lap and she says, Eigewalt, whatever that means. I could tell this is totally hysterical in this crowd, but Eigewalt <laughs> being a kind of, you know, a, the Yiddish that she then claims not to know. The phenomenon of Yiddish, of, I'm sorry, the phenomenon of linguistic interference the pressure of an unspoken language on the one being spoken is here given a much stronger emotional charge. Linguistic interference is not just a kind of grammatical effect or a kind of syntactical effect. Rather, it names a profound battle between more superficial and deeper strata of the Jewish self, between a language that represents the thin veneer the accultural, acculturated facade and the suppressed but indelible tongue that is always threatening to break through. This psychic architecture, as Yovel makes clear about the split self more generally, is not the particular property of Jews, nor indeed was it discovered by psychoanalysis. Bachelard, in his Poetics of Space, uh, explores a long history of cultural expressions about the shared structure of self, body, and house, reading the anxieties of everyday life as emerging from an inevitable tension in every psyche between the inside and the outside, between claustrophobia and agoraphobia. Lacan makes a similar point that the internal self, which is supposedly a given of primal being, is actually experienced as distant and unattainable. And he says that the I is symbolized in dreams by a fortress, its inner arena and enclosure surrounded by marshes where the subject flounders in search of the lofty, remote inner castle. But this distinction between inner and outer, secret and revealed, took on a particular force within <coughs> Jewish emancipation and enlightenment, the Haskalah, when it was charged with the task of producing a Jew who might be integrated into the modern nation state. In service of such modernization and citizenship, a, a famous Haskalah slogan directs Jews to be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. That this advice was also about language is clear enough from the 1866 poem from which the slogan was taken, Yehudalev Gordon's Hakitsa Ami, Wake Up, My People, which exhorts the Jew to speak in the language of the Gentile neighbors who stretch out their hands to you in peace. Whatever Gordon may have meant by recommending to Jews in this poem that they keep their Jewishness at home, Jewish nationalists took it as unwelcome advice to hide the Jew within us as contraband merchandise 
in the secrecy of our tent, as if it were a disgrace to be known as a Jew. Both sides of the Jewish assimilationist nationalist spectrum thus developed an ideology of the split self. And both these ideologies placed Yiddish beneath or within European languages. For modernizers, for modernizers and reformers, Yiddish was lower because it was the language that needed to be suppressed for Jews to be accepted as citizens of the state. But the language of ideology understates the visceral charge of these attitudes. Yiddish was the despised jargon, the filthy language of the Eastern European unwashed masses, the language of women and of traditional Jews. This lowness of Yiddish among diaspora nationalists who worked to ideologically recuperate the language was not denied, but rather transvalued. Yiddish was still low. But this lowness now signified proud working class affiliations, Jewish intimacy and at-homeness, Jewish interiority as well as authenticity. Yiddish was now the marrow, the mamaloshan, the mother tongue, but here the mommy tongue, the spintle yid, that, that core little Jewish essence that could never be extinguished, the very unconscious of the modern Jew. Einspruch's project of casting the New Testament in a richly idiomatic Yiddish voice was a product of this cultural re uh, recuperation, as was modern Yiddish culture writ large. But the recuperation of Yiddish is also intimately bound up with the history of psychoanalysis, um, although for reasons I'll explore, this is a story that requires us to dig beneath the surface of the, of the German text. Not Yiddish, but rather an unnamed, indecipherable ancient tongue plays a role in Freud's description of the psyche as a stratified archeological site. The primary model he used for understanding the dimensions of the self. In one of his earliest papers on hysteria, published in 1895, same year as, as the book came out, Freud wrote, Imagine that an explorer arrives in a little known region where his interest is aroused by an expanse of ruins with remains of walls, fragments of columns, tablets with half a face and unreadable inscriptions. He may content himself with inspecting what lies exposed to view, with questioning the inhabitants that live in the vicinity, but he may act differently. He may have brought picks, shovels, and spades with him he may clear away the rubbish and uncover what lies buried. If his work is crowned with success, the discoveries are self-explanatory. The numerous inscriptions, by good luck, may be bilingual, revealing an alphabet and a language. And when they have been deciphered and translated, they may yield undreamed of information about the events of the remote past to commemorate which the monuments were built. To translate, the self is a room, that I can relate to, in which events of the remote past lie buried under layers of sediment. The psychoanalyst is a traveler with a shovel, rejecting the tall tales of present day inhabitants, which is to say, whatever information you get from the patient herself and her family, um, in favor of spade work and his own interpretation and translation. The monument, is a symptom, dream, or other barely legible manifestation of a long buried event. The curious detail of the bilingual inscription was no doubt suggested to Freud by the Rosetta Stone, which is only the most famous of the various multilingual monuments deciphered in the course of the 19th century. And I think you know that Freud was very interested in antiquities. But the hieroglyphics and demonic Greek I'm sorry, of the Rosetta Stone may themselves have been suggested to Freud because what he's describing in this elaborate model is Jewish hysteria. That is, the hysteria of the Viennese Jewish multilinguals whose languages <coughs> played such an important role in their symptoms. More particularly, the figure translated into the language of archaeology is Anna O, oh, the first and by far the most important study in the hysteria book. She was Freud's patient, 
And she came up with both the practice and the term talking cure. And as is evident in the German text, but not in the English one, English translation, this term was coined in English during a period in which Anna O's hysteria manifested itself as the inability to speak German. Freud, uh, I'm sorry, Breuer reports that his patient knew German, Italian, French, and English. Among the earliest signs of her hysteria was paralysis of the right side accompanied by a deep functional disorganization of speech. Anna O first looked for words she could not find, then her speech lost all grammatical structure, the syntax was missing, as was the conjugation of verbs. As the disorder developed, she could find almost no words at all, um, unless she painfully pieced together a sentence out of four or five different languages. You should all be so lucky to have this kind of hysteria. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, also made her almost incomprehensible. Whenever, and now I'm quoting um, Breuer, whenever she attempted to write, she used the same jargon, dem selben jargon. Deeper into her crisis, Anna acquired, acquired the ability to speak English without realizing that that's what she was doing. According to Breuer, English was both the pathological symptom of her aphasia, her German aphasia, and a psychic compensation, an accidental workaround for the German words she couldn't bring herself to speak <laughs> that she discovered accidentally when one night, tormented by hallucinations of snakes at her father's sickbed, Anna tried to pray, but all that came to her was an English nursery rhyme, all the king's horses and all the king's men. Breuer subjected his very interesting and beautiful young patient to a kind of public performance of her symptoms, a kind of practice of the day. This isn't Anna O, this is, I think, Charcot. Before the eyes of visiting doctors, Anna read a French or Italian text she had been handed by sight reading an excellent English translation with astonishing rapidity and fluency. Unfortunately, later, Anna lost even this ability, which might have made her some money. Um, this hysterical aphasia, I would suggest, may actually have biblical resonances. Psalm 137 asks, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? The next verse is very nearly a proleptic paraphrase of Anna O's hysterical symptoms. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If Jewish languages have a long history, so may their forgetting and loss. The languages missing in Breuer's catalog of Anna O's languages are, of course, Jewish languages, and especially Yiddish, which at least one critic supposes to have been the native <coughs> tongue not only of Anna O, but also of Breuer and maybe Freud as well. We've known since 1953, when Ernest Jones revealed her identity in his Freud biography, that Anna O, was the cover for Bertha Pappenheim, Bertha Pappenheim, a well-known Orthodox Jewish feminist who founded and served as the first president of the Yiddische Frauenbund, um, the Jewish Women's League, among many other activities. The gap between the paralyzed hysteric and energetic activist, the young woman, half palindrome, half zero, Anna O, who in her suffering, Breuer thought might be better off dead, and the mature woman who stepped forth so vigorously onto the public stage is sometimes resolved through a feminist reading of hysteria as feminine protest against the constraints of bourgeois life, which is first expressed as illness and then healed through activism. But this point can be made more specific Anna O oh and Bertha Pappenheim are connected because they are both translators. The first is a hysterical translator, and the second, a feminist Jewish translator. While Breuer fails to mention the language Anna O oh might, ha might have prayed in, 
The very first sentence of Elizabeth Luntz's biography of Pappenheim asserts that as an Orthodox Jew, Pappenheim knew both Hebrew and Yiddish well. Um, and uh, her father was a recent emigrant from uh, the eastern regions of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And she adapted traditional Hebrew prayers in German, also translating from and into Yiddish. Along with her important translation of Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women, Pappenheim also translated the Yiddish Women's Bible, the Tzenarena, the major text of Jewish women's religiosity um, from 1623 to the advent of Germanization, um, which spelled the end to the women's Bible as well as to an entire genre of Yiddish women's literature. And I don't know if I should say just another word or this, but I don't know how many of you know that there's an entire literature in Yiddish, which is called Yiddish Women's Literature, published in a distinctive script, which includes many translations of the Bible directed at women. And this was a kind of gendered variation of the Protestant Reformation, which is directed toward um, uneducated people, including women. Um, in the Jewish world, there are at least theoretically no uneducated men. All men are rabbis, so in the theoretical sense. So as a legal fiction, the Protestant Reformation and the uh, compiler of the, of the Yiddish Women's Bible was called the Jewish Martin Luther. Um, this particular genre was directed only at women, even though men read it. Um, since many men were not in fact rabbis and did not in fact know Hebrew. Um, but this kind of legal workaround, this gendered legal workaround, um, women providing permission for the translation into the Jewish vernacular um, was what pre prevented Judaism from having the kind of schism um, that separated Protestant vernacular translation from Roman Catholicism. That was a whole other lecture, and a di but just to give you a little sense of what's being recovered here um, and what was lost with uh, the turn to German. Pappenheim also brought to life what is undoubtedly the single most important document of Jewish women's history, the old Yiddish memoirs of her 17th century ancestor, great, 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 great aunt, Glickel of Hamlin, and there she is dressed as Glickel, um, that's the cover of her book. It says, Zechreinus uh, Maras Glickel Hamlin, the memoirs of Glickel Hamlin. She illustrated this book with herself dressed in uh, 17th century Jewish dress, female dress. Um, and this is the earliest autobiography of a Jewish woman that we possess. It was circulated among the family for a few centuries before this great niece uh, translated it and, and edited it and presented it for publication. Pappenheim also used Yiddish in the course of her feminist activism. Tra for instance, uh, translating reports about the Jewish involvement in the white slave trade for rabbis and leaders of the Eastern European Jewry. And maybe I'll just say that among her feminist activist activities was uh, the, the Jewish uh, Women's League was very active in what was a very shameful um, aspect of Jewish life at the turn of the 20th century, which was the Jewish involvement in um, international sex traffic. Um, both pimps and prostitutes were uh, Jewish, mostly Eastern European Jews. And one of uh, Pappenheim's uh, activist projects was to try to create a network of institutions that could house at-risk women, including one that she herself staffed and lived in including immigrants from Eastern Europe um, to Germany and, and Austria. So um, while Anna O oh couldn't call a Jewish prayer to her lips, Pappenheim composed her own German prayer book, which is still in print. It just saw the fourth reprinting in 2012. Sandra Gilman supposes that the decomposition of Anna O's oh German may in fact have been the interference of Yiddish into that language which is also accused, I mean, Yiddish is also accused regularly of lacking a grammar or syntax. Breuer may have been hinting as much when he called her gibberish jargon, um, one of the many pejoratives that Yiddish accumulated over the centuries. Anna O's symptom in this case 
is cultural rather than individual, reflecting the ways that acculturating Jews in general labored to extirpate the lingering effects of Yiddish speech within their German, especially when they were around non-Jews or in polite society. Um, they tried to suppress the accent, the intonations, the gesticulations that, that everyone, uh, Jews and anti-Semites, called mauschlin or yudelin, which means to speak like a Jew. Um, Pappenheim describes a Russian countess she knew, her face screwed up with disgust as she spoke of that unmistakable, horrible Jewish intonation. If Yiddish indeed is among those other languages that played a role in Anna O's hysteria, neither the language nor the disgust it evokes are speakable in studies in hysteria, forming an even more occluded stratum beneath Anna O's lost German. If Anna O's suffering remained uncured because it was never fully articulated, this suffering may have been alleviated not only through Pappenheim's feminist activism, but also, and more specifically, through her feminist Yiddish translation, which reclaimed Yiddish not only as the denigrated jargon of Jews that they labored to suppress, but also, more specifically, as the denigrated language of Jewish women. Um, not only anti-Semitism, but also Jewish patriarchy contributed to the denigration of Yiddish by men who looked down on women's lack of Hebrew and who feared themselves tainted by their own unavoidable associations with the language marked as female. Pappenheim's translation of Yiddish women's literature was part of a much larger early 20th century Jewish renaissance among German-speaking Jews, which mobilized translation, education, and activism to restore the connection between modern Jews and their own tradition. Um, and I think Shen Jin's, uh, uh, the translation, Wilhelm's translation of Taoist material is part of the same zeitgeist of looking to the East. For Jews, it was the, it was the Jewish East. Uh, for Germans, it was East more general as a way to revive what was considered a kind of desiccated and deracin deracinated culture. But while Buber looked, as I said, to the Jewish East to revitalize modern, Jew modern German Jewry, Pappenheim's translations stayed in Germany and more pointedly attempted to discover a female past for German Jewish women, a past that's still registered in their own speech. As I've said, Pappenheim enjoyed dressing like her ancestor Glickel, signaling a more than usual, usually intense identification with her source text, ancestor, and imagined history. The solution to the crisis of Jewish modernity was not to futilely attempt to erase the markers of Jewish difference, but rather to embrace them, to reclaim the language in its integrity and history. Pappenheim spoke of Yiddish as the keeper of unbroken natural Jewishness. And she allowed Yiddish, unlike Buber, to shape her German style. Nor did Pappenheim see ground to German in relation to Yiddish, declaring Yiddish not only to be an authentic variety of German, a true Jewish dialect, but in fact, the most authentic dialect of German as the protector of the old Jewish, oh, I'm sorry, the old German language, precisely by virtue of Jewish insularity and conservatism, Yiddish had succeeded in keeping alive the old German that modern German had blithely abandoned. Despite her sentimental recourse to the unbroken natural continuity of Jewishness in Yiddish, Pappenheim too must be understood as a split self, taking recourse to translation to paper over a rupture that such projects could hardly hope to heal. In this sense, Pappenheim, despite remaining an Orthodox Jew for her entire life, was also a kind of convert, the crypto-Jew lurking within the universal lang universalizing language of psychoanalysis, the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the Freudian hieroglyphics in Greek, 
hiding rather than registering her own lost language, her tongue cleaving to her mouth in a foreign land. It may be no surprise then that Pappenheim was fascinated by the figure of, Germ of the Jewish Christian convert, returning to this interest in more than half of her short stories, including her first one and her last one. And I'll just talk here about her last published story, which appeared in 1933 um, in the shadow of the rise of National Socialism. The Erbschaft, the inheritance, concerns the aging professor and Christian convert, Johannes Gabriel, who reaches out to long lost Jewish relatives in America who, who might help him escape Germany. Looking through a secret compartment in his desk in hopes of finding evidence for this family connection, Gabriel discovers nothing but some old letters in an illegible script, a signet ring, a little box in the shape of a tower, a hand with a pointing finger, and similar strange things, which I will leave untranslated as Pappenheim did. Against the racialist notion of ineradicable Jewish blood, Pappenheim poses Jewish languages and ritual objects, which may rescue Gabriel even, um, even if their significance lies beyond his own comprehension. If so, the Anna O buried in Freud's archeological site wrote her own monument to the buried Jewish past, translating Freud's Rosetta Stone into her own. The story is open-ended, leaving us to wonder whether Gabriel, Gabriel's condition or ours may ever be healed. But Pappenheim herself, even if she could read the inscriptions on the page, can hardly escape Gabrielle's condition, which is to say, the condition of the modern split self. What would, const what would constitute the translation of these words, the pointer with no text left toward which to point, ritual implements that are relics of a world no longer in operation? I have suggested that Pappenheim's feminist translation work in which the grotesque and suppressed words of Yiddish might finally ring out in full throat may have been a talking cure for the disgust and fear that closed down Anna O's own voice box. But if translation saved Pappenheim from the fate of Anna O, it did not thereby restore her to her great, great, great aunt. Despite the intense identification signified by her costume, the very need to translate Glickel's memoirs betrays the unbridgeable rift that separated traditional ancestor from modern descendant as it separated the German translator from her Yiddish source. The secret compartment lodged in the desk of the convert holds a language both familiar and foreign indecipherable hieroglyphic messages from an irretrievable past, a worthless rune that may nevertheless also open the key, if only we knew how to turn it to our deepest selves. Thank you.